The Lemonade Car Show is sponsored by OMVIC, Ontario's vehicle sales regulator. Hi and welcome to the Lemonade Car Show. I'm your host Lorraine Sommerfeld. We're brought to you by Omvik and Crown and Sound Insurance. Today we have something a little bit different. I did the Rally de Gazelle, which is in Morocco. It's this huge women's only rally. And it's, if, if you've never heard of it, it's the biggest rally you've never heard of. If you go on Google, you can find it. Anyway, it's really, really exciting. It's terrifying. It's all these things. It's all women. And I took my sister with me, and I have her here today with me, Jillian Lemos. Hi. I almost called her Sommerfeld because that's how <laughs> my brain still works. And my boss, Neil Verano, who has been on the show several times. The reason I have Neil here, he was also in Morocco with us. He was covering the electric car angle of the, yes. show, of the rally, the show, which we'll get to in a few minutes. But this rally was a once-in-a-lifetime thing for me, I know, and probably for Absolutely. you, too. I hauled you along because I got told by um, the powers that be to bring somebody I wouldn't kill. So you happen to be the person I wouldn't kill. Thank now, you. Neil, you, you, can, you got the invitation. That's how we ended up there. Explain a little bit about the rally. For okay, viewers. so the rally has been around since 1990. Uh, it's, a, again, an all-female rally. And uh, it started off with, I believe, nine teams, uh, nine teams of two women each in a car in 1990. Now it's up to what? 166. 166 teams in the rally. Uh, purely uh, navigation, not speed. So um, it's the shortest distance, not the fastest time to get there, uh, which, is, which is good for safety. But it's also, as you guys can attest, uh, still a very difficult rally. It's excruciating. This is where Jilly comes in because she was my navigator. And I'm quite comfortable driving off-road situations. I've done a lot of it. I've had some amazing trainers. You don't just drive off-road one day and decide you're going to do it. Sand is all new to me. Um, incredibly difficult to drive in sand. But Jill had the tough, tough job of navigating. Now, there's no GPS and no nav. What were the tools we were stuck with? Sorry, did we get? <laughs> we were given very old maps and compasses and the reason that the maps were so old was so that they wouldn't show us where any of the roads were so and they didn't they didn't then <laughs> they, they barely showed us the mountain ranges or what we were actually driving through because it you didn't know what you were driving through until you were driving through it and trying to navigate around mountains and sand dunes and trees and forests and everything that can get thrown in front of you and try to stay on a straight line and get to your next checkpoint. Now, one of the things, we got lost one day, and you were actually, you were there for a handful of days, Neil. We were there for the entire duration. <laughs> yes. It's an eight-day rally. We put over 2,000 kilometers on our 4x4. Four four. Most of it was spent in circles being lost, I swear. It was but that distance between two points, you did follow us for a few hours in a media truck. Yes. Were you guys surprised at how hard uh, this was? This uh, is where you say yes. Well, yes, <laughs> yes, I was. Uh, luckily, in the media truck, we had the benefit of an actual GPS unit. Uh, we actually had an arrow that pointed to where you were supposed to go. Oh, neat. So, yes. <laughs> Thanks for all hey, the help, boss. <laughs> we couldn't help. We couldn't help. So, uh, but it was interesting. We knew where the checkpoint would be. But we were following your guys' uh, direction and like trying to think of how you were uh, seeing this simply through maps and rulers and and uh, uh, yeah, you use know. those spinny rulers. Right, things. right, right. Yeah, you get coordinates in the morning, longitude and latitude, and you plot it. Yeah, and you go easy, and you draw a line to the next one, and you draw, you draw it right across a mountain range, right? Mm -hmm. And newbies, which we were, there's some people that have been there over ten times, twelve times. Some of these women are hardcore. It's yes. amazing. We drive up to the mountain and go, now what? And we saw another team, many other teams, and said, what, how are you guys doing it? They go, we drive to the edge and we look. <laughs> uh -huh. The smarter teams were already plotting around things because they knew from the maps. We didn't know. Like, right. It's so hard to tell, which was crushing. Wow, there's so many things to, to learn there. I mean, it's your first time. Uh, your first time even navigating with a map and stuff like that. So, yeah. of course, it's a learning experience, you know. Well, even... You get used to paper maps here. I remember Dad used to make us plot trips out west to Saskatchewan. Do you remember that? I remember driving to Saskatchewan. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the whole map on yeah. the back seat. Are we there yet? Here, he threw the map. Uh -huh. It's like, it's only this far away. How can it be so far? <laughs> but you, you, can't, you can't get assistance. You can only talk to other... We're wearing these pink vests. 
which are very stylish. You have to wear them for the entire eight days. So by the end of eight days, you can make soup out of them because the sand and the wind. But you can only talk to people wearing these vests. You had on a press vest, which was beige, I think. Beige, yes. So you're verboten. We could not ask yes. you anything. And again, I had to wear that all the time, too, to differentiate. Oh, oh, oh sorry. sorry. <laughs> yeah. The hardest thing you do is wait for the bar to open. <laughs> yes, <laughs> We were driving for our lives, <laughs> literally, sometimes. It really felt like that. But that feeling, it's very safe, and you know where they know where you are. But when you don't know where you are, you believe it. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. it feels very real to be lost. Absolutely. Yeah, and you get spun around and mm -hmm. spun around, and it's hard. Luckily, uh, you know, all of the competitors, including you, had these uh, electronics in your cars. Uh, where it back in the bivouac, back in the camp, where they had. Uh, they can track every competitor. They knew exactly where everybody was. So uh, it, 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 you were lost, but you're not lost to anyone else. That's a nice way luckily. to put it. We'll be back after this break with more discussion about the Gazelles Rally. <laughs> the Lemonade Car Show is sponsored by Omvic, Ontario's vehicle sales regulator. Lemonade Car Show is sponsored by Omvic, Ontario's vehicle sales regulator. Welcome back to the Lemonade Car Show, brought to you by Crown, Omvic, and Sound Insurance. I'm joined by my sister, Jillian Lemus, co-conspirator in the Gazelle Rally extravaganza, <laughs> and my boss, Neil Verano, with the National Post. We're talking about this rally. You, you have to drive wearing a helmet the entire time. And Jilly said to me, I think... Day one. <laughs> Is this really necessary? <laughs> it's like, yeah, we're off-roading. We're hanging by our seat belts. We are like doing crazy, crazy stuff. So you have to drive in a helmet the whole time. Um, the photos that are flashing up behind us, you can see everyone has to wear helmets. And these vests. That's why we're wearing these vests, because these are actually, um, people want these vests, which is good. I think they're very cool. They're very cool? Very yeah. cool. Jilly, describe a little bit about the living conditions while you're on the road. We shared a two-person pup tent for nine days, yes. nine glorious nights. Still don't know how to fold it. No. <laughs> no. That was the hardest part of this whole thing, was yeah. folding the tent. No. We always thought growing up that our room was pretty small. Yeah. This pup tent held two sleeping bags that and was us. It. Yeah, that and was us. And, and gear bags to weight it down because yep. the sandstorms are crazy. Yeah. And we were also talking about... Um, Oh, what were we talking about? Save me here. I can't realize. To, it took me weeks after I got home to actually get the sand out of my ears. We're, we're not. You talked about how we, the press knows where we're supposed to be. Yes. Well, the, and the, the organizers. Yes. Yeah, they know. The only people we can talk to are people also wearing these vests, which is 166 other teams. So you can compare coordinates because mm -hmm. you have different checkpoints and you see a flag and go, oh, there's a flag. And we'd lose our minds. And it's, it's the, the wrong, wrong flag. flag. But you can at least find out where that flag is and right. then redo that. But what, what did you like least about this? Or what I mean? <laughs> there were so many things that I loved The four o'clock wake up call. The four a.m. <laughs> wake up call was a little, Every day. A little distressing. And it's cold. Yeah. And it was, yeah, but you get used to that so quickly that yeah. it, the time difference doesn't make any, doesn't impact the four a.m wake-up call doesn't impact because you're so I think running on adrenaline yeah. you're just you're ready to go okay it's four o'clock let's start. let's go yeah let's go and you, you talked to a lot of other women Neil that were there and it's a real cross-section but mm -hmm. one thing most of them they're a lot younger than I am which not all no <laughs> no not I think all. the average age the median age is younger I think well but, the median age I think is 42 years oh, old okay. yeah so but you also need a lot of money to do this, and it's on bucket lists for a reason. It's right. incredibly hard. It's considered one of the most difficult rallies in the world. Mm -hmm. So the all women thing, don't don't be thrown by that. This thing is hard. The fact it's not testosterone based and like flat out racing yes. across the desert, but about forty thousand euro per team by the time you shake everything out, which yes. is a lot of money. But honestly, if 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 you're looking for that once in a lifetime thing to go do. Also, it, it is a lot of money, but it is run, I think it's run so well. It's so well organized. Uh, they have everything. They have, you know, uh, helicopters for uh, medical emergencies, thankfully, that wasn't needed. 
Yes, it was. Oh, it was. I called it once. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, it wasn't for me. Don't worry. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. you saw that the tent, uh, the the whole army of organizers to get behind all of this. Uh, so I can see why it costs a lot of money. But uh, yeah. I mean, it is a once in a lifetime thing. Although for some, it's a many time in a lifetime. I was going to say they yeah. go and get sponsors and come back sure. and do it again. But, yeah. Um, yeah. No, it's 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 worth it. it it's. The biggest test I've ever had mm -hmm. of physical, emotional, mental. I had Chris Muir, who most of the viewers know who's on all the time. He was helping me learn about tires because the tires have to go up and down and up and down. <laughs> we were working out with our trainer, Mike the Miracle Worker, <laughs> because <laughs> you phys if a tire goes flat, you have to change mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. you can't or digging go, sand out. Neil, your... get out of the media truck and yeah. come change a tire. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it. I can't I've seen do you it. change a tire. <laughs> And you guys also went through a, a, a quite a wide variety of terrain, also uh, like sand, huge sand dunes, uh, rocky, almost like a Mars-like surface, well, rocky you, you surface. You called it. It's yeah. volcanic rock. Yes, I mean, that's we were driving on it, and I said, "Rainy, it's black and it's sharp. This is made by a volcano." Because I didn't do any homework before I went to Morocco. I didn't know what we were, the territory that we we're going into, other yeah. than the mountains and desert. Yeah. And I'm like this has got to be volcanic because mm -hmm. this is the only thing that makes black, sharp rocks. And we were creeping across it. We had tire issues. Oh, yes. we, we hit some problems early on. But yeah. the dunes are National Geographic sized mm -hmm. sand dunes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. And oh. I, I've had the obligatory pictures of camels um, <laughs> we've got. It's pure Lawrence of Arabia there. Like, oh, it is. Absolutely. Yeah. But the organization puts a lot of money back into the region. They have medical caravans they bring, and they do stuff all year round. Mm -hmm. One of the few places that actually doesn't just leave stuff behind. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's a foot, there's a marathon being run right there, yes. right now, as reading this morning. Yeah. I've seen that, yes. Uh, also, the, the rally is uh, uh, certified for a sort of a ecological... Um, yeah. I, I, ISO certified, I can't remember the number, but yeah, anyway. Yeah, because they take everything that they bring in yes. and they take out so it's environmentally friendly as they well. They try and leave as Zero little impact, uh, impact as possible. Thank you, Jilly. I keep putting it through this stuff, but I really appreciate it. We had Probably. a blast. Thank you. It was. Neil, I th you'll be back. Sure. I believe. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. We'll be back in a minute. Lemonade Car Show is sponsored by Omvic, Ontario's vehicle sales regulator. The Lemonade Car Show is sponsored by Omvic, Ontario's vehicle sales regulator. Welcome back to the Lemonade Car Show, brought to you by Omvic Crown and Sound Insurance. I'm joined now by Chris Muir. And Neil Verano is back. We're still talking about the rally, but on a slightly different angle. There was a new component this year, and they introduced an electric class, which is actually the reason you were there. Yes. So for the first time for any sanctioned off-road event ever, uh, they have electric cars performing there. And it's a very small beginning. There, uh, there were five very tiny city cars and another car from Renault. Um, and they were... They're all front wheel drive, small cars, raised up a little bit, bigger tires, uh, but obviously not really meant for the, the terrain that, that, that was proposed there. But it's a start. It's a start. And the girls were getting stuck a lot and it was frustrating for them because they had to keep being towed out, but they kept it up till the end. Chris, what are some of the things that the electric cars were facing that perhaps me and my uh, Land Cruiser <laughs> was just gliding over? Well, it sounds like the first thing that, uh, the first real challenge there was just the drive system in them alone, right? Being a front wheel drive, those extra two wheels driving the car along, that's, that's a lot of advantage right there to begin with. Um, but I mean, you're dealing with, as far as an electric car in competition like that, especially endurance, you're dealing with uh, charge distance, you're dealing with weights, you're dealing with uh, added stresses to the electrical system just from the desert heat, um, as well as rugged terrain, things that the electrics probably weren't really originally designed for, where you look at a gas engine that's been around for 100 years, we figured out, okay, this is the best way to make it run, it's mature technology, and, and away it goes. Now you're taking something that was is in its infancy, designed for city use and commuting, and putting it into an extreme environment. So. A lot of it's just time and refinement that isn't there yet. To be honest, uh, I had a chance to talk with the, these two women. They're actually engin uh, Renault engineers who are driving a Renault Zoe, which is basically a Nissan Leaf. Mm -hmm. And they said that 
uh, in the city, it has about a 300 kilometer range, but when you get into this atmosphere where it's cold, it was 10 degrees in the morning, uh, yeah. you know, where they have uh, lower tires, uh, so a lot more uh, resistance there. Uh, they can get maybe 140 kilometers yeah. max, you know, so it, it does really impact the, the distance. Now they gave them, a, they had a different course than we did over the eight days and it was taking into account the fact that they do have other difficulties. It was still incredibly hard for these women. Mm -hmm. I, I felt, I'd see them every night, just got to be friends with a couple of them and I'm like, I feel so bad because they're so frustrating. Mm -hmm. because, except it was, I think they, they brought this category in and it's not just to get some attention and some headlines from it. I think it's because these vehicles eventually are going to have to be able to do all the things that we want yeah, uh, in an ice engine, in an electric. Mm -hmm. It's it's coming. It's a transitionary phase. We have to find other technologies to propel ourselves on a day to day. Plus, with our recreations, it's not just um, going back and forth to the supermarket. It's racing. It's uh, off road driving. It's anything that you can think of. We have to move away from fossil fuels so for and motorsports in general. This is the start of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what they were charging them at night from. A generator, but they also had, there were solar panels. Morocco yeah. is just bringing in huge solar systems, solar panel systems, and you see them built, and they're going to supply 25 or 50 percent of the country's power. That's the other thing they're talking about by showing off right. these cars. Mm -hmm. But they were charging them off a gas generator. Uh, or well, okay, diesel? so for for five of these cars, uh, they had. Uh, uh, 18 solar panels at, that charge a battery in a van uh, during the day and then when the cars come in they plug it in except that's only enough to charge one of the electric cars so the rest of the other four are hooked to a diesel generator that is also there to power the uh, mechanics yeah. quarters stuff like that so I mean it's not ideal uh, you know when you're talking about green energies and stuff like yeah. that but again it's a start uh, there are plans for uh, many more uh, solar panels in the future. So the goal is to have them charging yes. from solar stations. Yeah. And, and th this terrain, we've, we've only got a minute, but this terrain was so unforgiving. Mm -hmm. we've, mm -hmm. I, we keep bringing it up, but if you look at the photographs, you look out your windows, you're seeing massive mountains and then dunes to your left and then rock ledges that drop away 300 feet to your right. Like, the terrain is crazy. Asking it of even what we were driving was incredibly hard. We had to keep digging ourselves out and getting towed out. These little electrics, I was, I was kind of blown away at how good they did. Yeah, they were not bad. And, and I think the biggest uh, thing that's holding them back is not so much that they're electric, but that they're just city cars, front wheel yeah. drive. You know, if they actually had four by four electrics, I'm sure they would probably be able to do most of the course. Well, a lot of it was about clearance, yes. as yep. much as all-wheel drive. Yes. Because the clearance was, we were stuck up to our axles. I sure. Mean, there were so many times yeah. we were scooping sand out from above the axle. Mm -hmm. And that's when you want to be closer to the median age of 42 when you're, <laughs> you're shoveling out the sand. <laughs> it was so tough. <laughs> well, yeah, you, you saw everybody had to keep pushing. Mm -hmm. You need a whole bunch of gazelles <laughs> to yeah. push a truck yeah. up the top of a sand dune. Right. And people can choose not to help. And the girls in the electric, some of them were going by them saying, I, I'm not taking all the time to help you anymore. I know, I know. I, I hope that they, they do get some. Uh, and actually, they were testing a, a, a sort of electric dune buggy type vehicle. Uh, and hopefully, maybe they'll get a lot more of those next time because mm -hmm. I think it's kind of frustrating for the competitors who are in these city cars. Yeah. That so they the dune can't. buggies are easier to adapt. Uh, yes. We'll be back after this break. More Lemonade Car Show coming right up. The Lemonade Car Show is sponsored by Omvic, Ontario's vehicle sales regulator. Lemonade Car Show is sponsored by Omvic, Ontario's vehicle sales regulator. Welcome back to the Lemonade Car Show, brought to you by Omvic Crown and Sound Insurance. This is our viewers' favorite part of the show, Ask the Mechanic. First, though, one more Morocco thing. You've been to where I was. Not quite, well, you, but uh, close. in Morocco, in the desert, as a monitor for a race. So you know At the kind of conditions point. we were. Yeah, although ours was uh, cycling and... Um, 
and running. Oh, so you had, to, you had to make it tougher than what I did. Right no, there. No, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> the search vehicles, of course, were SUVs. Yeah. And even they got stuck. Oh, yeah. So it's, uh, it's uh, pretty difficult terrain, and it's also very easy to get dis disoriented, I realize. It's Thank you. Yes. Oh, no, everything just moves like this. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now that I feel better about that, let's queue up the first question. Hi, my name is Earl, and my question is for Chris. Uh, we have a 2011 Mazda 3 uh, with a four-cylinder engine, and what happens is that when it's minus 10 or minus 15 degrees outside, uh, we go to start it, and it won't start. Um, we can boost it, and it'll start, but everything under there, uh, warmer than that temperature, it will start. Uh, I've had it checked for... Uh, parasites in the electrical i've had the alternator checked i've replaced the battery twice because mazda said they had a bad run on batteries so i didn't pay for the battery but i replaced it um other than that i was thinking of installing a block heater to see if that would help um chris yeah that one's uh that one's a good one i like that one it's a bit of a stumper um so we know that the battery is going to be good. The electrical system seems to be all right. There could still be a parasitic draw that shows up when it's cold. Uh, it is a possibility. We know that it's an electrical concern because if we apply electricity to the vehicle, it'll start. Um, the one thing that I would ask is, does it still crank over or does it not crank over? Um, is it uh, maybe the computer dying and it's not firing an injector or it's not picking up on maybe a cam signal, something like that, if it is spinning over? And if it's not spinning over, well, at that point we have to go uh, further in and, and duplicate the concern and then diagnose that concern while it's present. It's not something that you want to just start firing parts at. It's time to really duplicate that concern and uh, see what the fault is, some hardcore diagnosis is due. Yeah, one thing our caller can do is um uh, Mazda has a very good uh, field operation for technical, mm -hmm. and uh, we do know the people at the top. Yep. So if he sends us the uh, work orders or a little bit of detail, maybe we could service it to them. The dealer may have already tried, mm -hmm. but um, if it's a problem that's really hard to hunt down, you might need some help from the Certainly, factory. and uh, taking an avenue with connections like that, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Perfect. I hope that helps. Take the next question. My name is Russell McBride. I'm calling from Scarborough, Ontario, and I'm trying to figure out when I'm purchasing a used truck, um, which brand sort of sticks out and which ones seem to not do so well in the ratings, uh, as I'm actively looking for a truck right now. So somewhere in the fifteen to $20,000 range. Pickup trucks, they're selling like crazy. So it's probably a good question. We're gonna hear a lot of this. Well, first thing before, what to buy is where to look. And I'm going to make a pitch for the Lemonade Guide. You can find it in uh, uh, either bookstores or uh, lending libraries. Yeah. And uh, the APA has some of the most complete information you'll find for used vehicles, for used pickups. It's so much fun to just read, too. Sorry. <laughs> I've got anyway. it in the bathroom, my kids, and having okay. all those friends go in there. And okay, now I'll okay, pass it over to Chris. Maybe just so, to 15 to 21, hmm, that's used. Yes. So that's a used pickup truck. Right now, it's a really tough time to be buying pickup trucks as their residual resale is through the roof still. So all the good pickup trucks that are recent, so if you're looking at anything one to three years old, they're going to the States. We actually have consumers mm -hmm. telling us, um, I'm getting a call from my dealer telling me to come in and turn it in on a new one, and it's not a scam. They're actually giving yeah. me almost full value for what yeah. I paid. The yeah. dealer can take a one-year-old pickup, and resell it in the U.S. for almost what the Canadian person bought. Okay, but for. Russell in Scarborough, where, <laughs> yeah, where's Russell's he going to get gonna it? Yeah, Russell's going to find he's going to be in something a little bit older. It so you're probably tricky. into that 8 to 10 year range, honestly, really? for a good pickup truck like wow. that. I was just looking at a GMC this morning, believe it or not. It's a 2011, and it was selling for uh, just under $20,000. So... Oh. Um, they again they've got a really high residual right now so that's as far across as, all the brands that's so across all the brands batch. okay um as far as uh, uh chrysler a bit less because yeah. it costs a little bit to export some of the chrysler's yeah. they they okay. they are reluctant the manufacturer puts pressure on the dealers not okay. to export but so if you're looking at 10 year old pickup trucks as george pointed out in the break I really do like GMs myself. I like the, the powertrains. The older ones are particularly proven. Um, Toyota is a really good marquee if you want to go after a, an imported pickup truck. But again, there's a big premium on, a, on something like a Tundra or a Tacoma. Uh, the Tacoma is long in the tooth. It's an older chassis, all that. 
Ford and Dodge are both relatively reasonable pickup trucks. Ford's got some timing chain issues. Dodge has got a couple knock issues in the engines, um, but GM's got some oiling issues in the six liter engine. So none of them are perfect unless you pick the right powertrains. Okay. Five three. Price are a couple of things to be concerned about on an older one is corrosion. Yes. You've got to look underneath them because they tend to rust. Ford, the difficulty is they had some really um, not so hot technology. So the early Echo Boost engines, a bit risky for buying new. So get hold of the Lemonade Guide. Yeah. Yes. And you're going to be moving down market with that kind of a budget. Right. Output. Or if yeah. you want to bring your cost <laughs> down, um, you could go for a smaller cab. Right. Yes, or regular a, cab. Yeah. Wants or the or one of the rare, I guess, <laughs> rear drive pickups that nobody wants. That's all the time we have for today, gentlemen. Thanks to everyone joining us at Lemonade Car Show in our Gazelle Rally special. Thanks, everybody.